for coming. I am Carol Little. I'm the math coordinator for all of elementary school, which means I make sure that we have a program that is aligned for the four-year-olds up to the 11-year-olds. We want our math to be building all the way up. And um, I'm also here, I help the teachers and I help parents. I help teach some kids. I work with Math Olympia kids at the upper end. Um, but in general, I'm here for the curriculum and the teachers. Um, we're going back in time. You guys have not been in first grade for a really long time. So I'm gonna ask you to remember that. You do know how to do this math, and I know you do, and I appreciate that. But what we are doing is we're trying to instruct our kids now so that they understand the math. When I went to school, I was told to just memorize it. I memorized well, I did well, until about 10th grade when I started saying, why should I care about this? And then I quit taking math, which is a real shame. In our world today, all of our sons and daughters need math. It's the way the world has changed, and all of them are capable and able to learn math. I don't want to see a show of hands, but I want you to think in your head, do you consider yourself a mathematician? You are. You do math every single day. You do it well. You have figured out ways to make it work. That's what we're instilling in your little precious six-year-olds. They're just at the point of knowing, they understand up to five. Their first unit in first grade was up to 10. Understanding up to 10 is a huge foundation for the rest of their lives. So they've worked with that for these first couple weeks, and now we're moving on to the teen numbers. What I want to go through with you today is how we're relating that knowledge of partnerships up to 10 to make everything else work. Does that make sense? I'm gonna quickly talk about the papers you have. The blue and the yellow are games you can play at home. If your children do not know, and I'm gonna use several different words, we call them 10 partners, we call them math facts, but that's the two plus eight, six plus four, five plus five. They need to, at this point, they understand them. They need to start playing these games where it's fun, where they internalize it, and that's where the memorization comes from. Showing flip cards just out of the blue, they can memorize for a few days. It doesn't tend to stick. You play card games with them, you let them play the games on the computers that are asking them to figure it out. And they have to catch the little fishy that's swimming away with the right answer. They're going to internalize it and they're going to be able to use it. So we're going to get started. No. And we have a little bit of technical difficulty, so I put this one out. I push this one here and I'm ready to go. It's going to take just a second. I'm going to review some vocabulary with you. Some of this is used with your children, some of it is not, but it's just so you can refresh yourself. Um, I just mentioned math facts to 10, they can be partners to 10, all of it is that 1 plus 9 equals 10, and 9 plus 1 equals 10, 2 plus 8, 8 plus 2. At this point, your kids do know the reversibility. They know that because they've built them, they've used manipulatives, they've used the 10 frames, and now they're starting to internalize it. We have not asked them to memorize it at this point, we're still using them. As they understand them, as they use them, they will memorize them. Um, compose and decompose. We use this language with kids because it's accurate. We don't test them on it. We keep explaining it over and over again. But to compose means to put together, and decompose means to take apart. This is the math I was not taught. I was taught that I had to memorize nine plus eight. I wasn't told that I could take the numbers apart and make it easier for myself. And that is what this unit is about. It's about decomposing numbers so that we can make tens, so that we can add and subtract easier. So decompose and compose. Again, the kids hear the language, 
we don't strategically ask them to use it, but they probably can. <coughs> if a six-year-old can you learn the term Triceratops, they can learn this. If we make it interesting and relevant, they can use it, instead of us using cute language that they then have to change to mathematical math language. And in fact, when we speak to them and make it fun that, oh, you're being a, you know, you're being a mathematician, they get excited about using the language. Um, this next one I'm going to comment. This is the equal sign. The word equal really doesn't mean a lot to, to kids. It's, it's a very um, abstract concept. But if you use the term same as, they're going to get it. Five is the same as four plus one. So that's a little bit change of language that we haven't used before, and it's made a huge difference in their understanding. We're going to come back to that at the end. Um, this symbol here, you've probably seen, it's called a number bond. It can be used many, many, many different ways. It can point any which direction, but it's used to help us take numbers and decompose them and compose them back together again. This is a way when, we, when you, your kids are asked to explain their thinking and you're wondering what do they mean by that? This explains to me how this child is thinking of 13. In this particular unit, we're asking them to look for 10s, so I'm looking for 10 and 3. Later, I might be looking for 7 and 6 or it may be their choice. So this is simply a number bond. You will be seeing them, oh, probably through middle school now. 10 frame. This is a tool that we use for kids to recognize 10. We put things on it, we can add, we can add, if we have five frogs sitting in a pond and three more join them, how many do we have? Our brain likes patterns, so this 10 frame where we're building things by fives, our brain can recognize eight pretty quickly. We know it can recognize five immediately, and with practice they start recognizing there's eight there, and I even know that there are two missing. This is with practice. <laughs> I'm not a six-year-old at this point. Um, again, we're asking your kids to show their thinking. What does a math drawing lock look like? If I have frog, five frogs in a pond, I do not want a gorgeous blue pond with lily pads and green frogs. That's art time, it's very clever, that's great at another time. A math drawing really is, usually it comes down to dots or it comes down to X's. It's something that is quick that shows their thinking. So I could do 12, I'm going to draw my I would call that my 10 frame. I need two more. The story or the math problem says take away five. I'm going to mark out five. I've just explained my thinking there. Three, draw right. When we're doing word problems, I'm so pleased not to hear a single groan when I said the word word problem. Um, mathematics is about solving real problems, not about a sheet of five minus two. Word problems are what real math is about. So we are now having all kids solve word problems all the time. We're not teaching them tricks, but we are teaching them strategies of how to deal with a word problem. First of all, you read it. Kids who are struggling often don't read it. They look for the numbers in there, and at first grade, they grab those numbers, they add them, and they give you an answer. In fifth grade, they read it, they grab them, they multiply, and give you an answer. Subtraction and division are pretty much non-existent if you don't read the problem. So what we do is we read the problem, we think about it, just like reading, we say make a mind movie. Picture what's going on in here. Then you need to draw and label your picture. If this were a word problem and it was the 12 frogs minus five, I would need to label this as frogs. First grade, I'm probably gonna let them write an F, but I need them to know which part of the story is what and what's going on. So they'll draw and label, and finally they'll write a number sentence and a statement that matches the story. You are going to see read, draw, write for the next five years. Um, it's, 
it's, an, it's good math. Um, they're getting used to it. They're just beginning now. A lot of this in first grade, we're still providing for them. And you'll see that as we go through the work today. Um, the last two words I put in tiny print, this is what we're doing mathematically. We do not use these terms in class. I say that a teacher might for the fun of it, the commutative property and the identity property. Your kids are not to know them by that name. But commutative property means that 2 plus 8 equals 8 plus 2. We all remember it thinking about commuting to work, how the cars change places, and it keeps going. And they're still equal. That's what this unit is based on. But that's a math term that they're not required. But in case you're wondering, wait a minute, I know I learned this. Um, and the associated property, I'm sorry, I said identity earlier. The associated property is that we can partner numbers together in different orders. Both of these, it is the community property of addition and it is the associative property of addition. They only work for addition and multiplication. And we're not going to get into that level of sophistication with the kids, but in case some of that's ringing a bell, you did learn this in probably seventh or eighth grade. Okay, so let's get to the math that the first graders are doing. As I said, our kids have learned tens. Our brain, our number system is based on base tens. We can add to it easily. It's, it's where mathematicians start talking. It's a rather beautiful system. Some people say there's no beauty in art or beauty in math, and, and mathematicians will argue with you. Um, so we're using what we know about tens. Bill went to the store. He bought one apple, nine bananas, and six pears. How many pieces of fruit did he buy in all? First of all, we would have start with manipulatives. He bought one apple. Yours are put together better. He bought nine bananas. And he bought six pears. Would you go ahead and grab those pieces? And grab your base, uh, not base 10, 10 frame. out the 10 and then count on to the rest of the numbers. 
It could look one and nine, it can look nine and one. But in this unit, we are encouraging them to use that knowledge of 10. So you can see here, we end up encouraging the one plus nine plus six would be 16. 10 plus six equals 16. Bill bought 16 pieces of fruit in all. This is what I mentioned earlier in the read, draw, write. This is the final sentence. In first grade, they're just filling it in because for them to write that whole sentence would take another eight minutes. Um, by the end of the year, we will gradually release that and hope that they're starting to do that on their own. And I'm also, my, my small caveat, I'm going through a six week lesson with you in 45 minutes. Please don't go home and turn to the last page and start trying to go over this and review with your child. They haven't seen it yet. We're not going to practice this. These, your kids are going to see many, many of these problems. You're going to see one or two and we're moving on. Okay. So it moves on from building it. We always build it first to drawing it. But we can move on to drawing the picture and doing it a little bit more independently. So now we have 7 plus 4 plus 3. We want them, what are the two numbers that add to 10? 7 and 3. So 7 plus 3 equals 10. 10 plus the other 4 equals 14. And they probably are going to draw it up here. There's a couple different ways of drawing it. I just want to see that they're understanding that they're filling in a 10. And this is where how we compose the 10 is with the 7 and the 3. If it doesn't say that they of their homework, it doesn't say that they have to do a um, um, math story or math drawing. Do they have to, or is it kind of voluntary? If it says they have to explain their thinking, I would expect to see a drawing. We do get to the point where they're just practicing. I mean, it, the, like, the last two problems that come with no, nothing, I would expect just an answer. We are moving. This is, they're using manipulatives and drawing. The goal for a lot of math is that we start, do a lot more math in our heads now. We used to be taught algorithms that you really had to use paper and pencil where there really were other ways to do it that were more efficiently done in your head or more efficiently than digging through your purse for your calculator. So this is one of those strategies that moves on to being very efficient. If eight plus three plus two, and I immediately see eight plus two is 10 plus, eight plus two is 10 plus three is 13. It's very efficient. So that's the end goal. That's not the goal for tomorrow. Um, but kids start picking up on it because they practiced it and it's because they built it first and then they drew it and they're really understanding what they're doing. So in this, the instructions probably would have said, show me what you're adding first and then get 13. On six plus seven plus three, what would we add first? And this is that associative property in the adult world that we're talking about. We can put any two numbers together that we want to add. Uh, two, I'm not gonna ask this. I'm not gonna switch back and forth with the computers because of the time. I'd like you to take out your pencil. I'm gonna ask you to add up a column. Go ahead and write them in a column of numbers. Would you add one plus six plus eight plus five plus three, plus two, plus seven, plus five, plus nine, plus four. I'm gonna say it over again. It's one, six, eight, five, three, two, seven, five, nine, and four.
Three partners, see if you got the same answer. Did you do one plus six is seven, seven plus eight is 15, eight, no, 15 plus five is 20, 23, 25, 32. Yes, as soon as you know about tens, this becomes a very easy problem. This is not a first grade problem, but you just start ma um, matching them up. One and nine, six and four, eight and two, five and five, seven and three. It was much simpler to count by tens than to start doing all that regrouping. So here's the end goal that we hope, is that your kids start learning these strategies to use what's efficient and what's easy. drawings, but they understand what they're doing. Now we're going to move on to how can we use that with other knowledge. I'm sorry, with other problems. So 9 plus 3. Well, I'm going to go back to my 10 frame. Actually, go ahead and build it. If we want to get our answer, what are we going to do to that three? Yeah. So let's go back to that math talk. I'm going to decompose the three and put it up there. And now I have 10 plus 2. So they're doing this multiple times. Then we're getting them over to drawing it and taking the notes. What did I do? I took my three. I made it into one and two. Nine and one equals 10. So I have 10 plus two equals 12. This is another way of showing it. So we have a number bond to show it and we have a math drawing to show it. Yes? If, if, uh, and I don't know if this will happen on year one, but if they have to write the entire math bond, how would they write the nine in there? Like they just circle the nine yeah, and then yeah. and that's just, now I guess it will. Um, the number bond is part, part, whole, so it would really end up being 12 and nine and three. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So if we were to just represent the problem, which you will, They'll figure that out. It would be blank, and there would be nine and a three. Okay. That would be definitely further on okay. when they're understanding how to add nine plus three. This is 
back to that property, we do encourage the kids that it's more efficient to start with the nine than the four. So they're going to build the nine, decompose the four. What happens to the four? It becomes three and one. I've made my 10. I've got three more. 11, 12, 13 is fine. As you've probably noticed with teachers, we can be real nerds. So I'm reading a book on how the brain learns math, and I find it interesting. We call our numerals digits. We also call our fingers digits. It goes back about 2,000 years to Syrian language. There is a reason that we are base 10, and our numbers are called digits, and our fingers are called digits. These are very good math tools right now. We do not expect your kids to stay at this point, but our fingers are very good math tools and they're always with us. Now, we would be doing them a big disservice if we didn't move them along from that. Um, but there are times, as a professional, that I will double check myself, especially like when you're talking about days of the week and you're adding on three days, I will make sure. What it is, is we're teaching them is when do you use them, when are they efficient, and when are other strategies more efficient. So if I have to publish something, I kind of go back to my most basics to ensure that I'm correct. Okay, we're going to keep moving. One of the items in this unit is, as you can tell, we are really pushing 10. And I, when I first looked at this next part, it was a little awkward for me. It says write the number bond for the related 10 fat. So we're now, we've moved away, we're not giving them the bond, but it is what we're expecting. What do they need to add to eight to get 10? So I'm decomposing my six into two and what? So now I've got my answer. What is the related 10 fat? This is where I get messed up. This is supposed to be my whole is 14, but in my brain I've added 10 plus four. That is the 10 fact that goes with this. It's once again just getting that practice of changing and composing to 10s first. Would you go ahead and do the next one and see if your partner agrees with you? And the last one is a challenge problem. And it's also, to be honest, the number bond can be seen in many which directions, so we just wanted to show it to you. I personally think that one looks upside down, but it still works the same. It is part, part, whole, or whole, part, part. Sake of time, I'm going to keep drawing. This says they ate 
five yellow clumps. I've drawn it, but I need to label this. I could allow Y for yellow. Do I eat? Yes. And then I ate some red clumps. I don't know how many I ate yet. So I draw it as a circle. It's a blank. What is the blank? What am I trying to figure out? The red clumps. If she ate 11 in all, how many red clumps did Maria eat? If you've envisioned that and you see this picture, this has to equal 11. I need to draw, let me see, I have 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Do I have a total of 11 plums now? How many of them are red? Maria ate 6 red plums. So if your child made circles all over the place and came up with the right answer, are they correct? Absolutely. We show them patterns to use simply to help them. Most kids like the patterns, but I'm not going to fight with a child over how they draw their pictures. The only time I'm going to have issues is if they're still drawing that beautiful red plum back at the beginning. Again, we love art class, it's good for us, but this is a math drawing. We use our pictures to facilitate our thinking. So did we read the problem? We had to have. Did we draw and label it? I've got yellow plums, I've got red plums. And did I write a number sentence and statement that matches the story? And at first grade, it means they're simply filling it in. That last statement is also a check on am I really answering what the question ans asked me to do. Would you go ahead and read, draw, and write the next question? Actually, the problem. Solve it. Can I ask you a language question? Do you guys know what a bridge is? I mean, as I type this up, I'm realizing it's, it's a refrigerator. In the U.S., we shorten it to fridge all the time. We are aware of the second language learner issues. In first grade, they would be reading this together, and that would be explained. something, but I like subtracting better. 
we take it right back to soccer. If you don't practice kicking that goal from the other side, you're not going to learn how to do it. So yes, we will ask them to practice something even though they know a different way. They may never like the other way, or with practice, um, they may come to like it. So. But at this point, are they starting using subtraction like the teacher You know, it all depends on the child. Is it likely? No. They're more likely to add up. Yeah. I mean, the last problem is a subtraction problem. Uh, isn't it 19 dogs in a puddle? Some left. There are seven dogs left. So what are you going to do? My way of thinking of it is I've got 19. Well, I've got 18 left. I've got 17, 16, 15, 14, 13. You get the idea. I bet I can listen to me. I mark out until I see seven dogs left. How many left? How many ran away? 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Did I do that? Still. That's a wrong question, isn't it? Isn't it? No, 12 dogs left. Excuse me? Yes, thank you. They would be they would be finishing all of these. Uh, so this was five. that's what we figured out. If we don't know which number they figured out, they, they're asked to circle it or put a square. Yes? Could you show how we would um, not subtract the second one, the add-on by grade one would do? Like how we would draw it, how our children would draw it if they're not doing it at the third one? Okay, so she had some eggs. Yeah. She bought 12 more. Now she has 18. I've got 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Here's I have trouble doing it in the five. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So they would They're most likely that. going to count up. Yeah. Um, counting up used to be one of those things I remember teachers telling me it was wrong if I did it. And I it's very much a reversal of thought. It's a very good strategy for certain type of problems. They will even talk in this unit about unit about when you count up and when you don't. I mean, they'll start comparing strategies. Um, these aren't good examples, but it depends on how close the numbers are together. If they're within three or four, counting up is a very good strategy. If you have to count up 18, you're going to get lost. You're not going to be able to keep track of it. They they will be discussing that class and they will be talking about the strategies. When is it better to use one than another? Strategies don't, the first one taught is not necessarily the simplest and each one gets better. The strategies are for certain situations. We will definitely grow out of some, but we won't grow out of others. It will still just depend on the problem. Yes. Um, they're probably going to be below 20. So, so we are from, we are the point to 20. And at this point, you don't want them to do the case uh, value. No, we're not they, they can't. They can't do 12 minus 4 written in a column. They haven't, I mean, that's memorization. That's they haven't memorized it yet. So, so if they have a big number up to 20, they can just, what you expect from the first grade, they, they can just do the X's and the symbols. And, and to be honest, I because of the speed we're moving, I'm expecting them to do it with the cubes first. Oh, okay. Um, there, there's just tons of tons of studies. They yes. need to build it with their hands first, mm -hmm. then they can go to the drawing. And through all that, that, that's where the understanding comes. Once you understand something, you can remember it easily. If you don't understand it, the memorization is very difficult. So no, we're not expecting them to write 12 minus 4 in a column and come up with 8. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure that they'll particularly see it written in a column in first grade. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they might see it written in a column below 10 because at this point they understand it completely. Um, we're going to switch gears here and 
related a little bit to that. This is the time when we are having to explain what our place value in our number system works. And pretty much English is a horrible language. Um, Japanese, Chinese, um, lots of language have a very, it's, it goes from 9 to 10, 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3. Which is very logical, but English is not going to change. And we have these five or six numbers, well actually through the teens, that don't follow a pattern. It's hard for them to understand it because at this point we have to keep creating it. So at this point, we break the numbers apart a lot. So you will see towards the end of this unit things coming out about place value. So our ladybugs. We have a 10 and two more. It's written as 12. It, that number tells us that there is one 10 and two ones. The number 12 is simply a symbol, and to a child that is very abstract. So they will be seeing a lot of pictures representing what this one means. Six weeks ago, one meant one. Now we have it in a different place in our system, and now it means 10. So they will be doing a lot of practicing with learning what the place value means. He's showing pictures. So we have one ten and four ones. It's written as 14. This picture or drawing is of cards that they use in class that build on each other. So you've got a 10 and then you put a four over the ones place and they can actually take them apart and put them back together. This is a drawing of it but they'll be playing with the cards in class. And what does that mean? It means they're, oh, why is pen? Just gave out. So they have one ten and four ones. Here we are back to our number bond. put it into the real world situation. Frankie and Maya made four big sand castles at the beach. If they made 10 small sand castles, how many total sand castles did they make? I draw it, I label, these are big. Here are my small, how many total do I have? Well I have, Six plus ten equals sixteen, and my answer is one ten and six ones. Oh, because I don't know how to count? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've yet to do one of these where I don't make one of those mistakes. Oh, because that was for B, not a six. There we go. And can I use this? turn it into something good. All of us make those type mistakes. When you're working with your child, if you hear something, you know, they've been going along just fine, and do I still have a mistake? I didn't change the bottom. Um, talk to them. Find out, do they really not understand it? Or did they do, did they do something like that? Um, because we do. We, we make careless errors. And that's why we have ways of double checking our work. Um, would you go ahead and do the Rami story?
And we want to make really, want to make sure that these kids are understanding that equal does not mean give me an answer. It means make, it, make sure that it's balanced, it's the same as, it's the same quantity. Um, balanced makes sense to us as adults. We found that with, with little kids it doesn't make that much sense yet. A balance is actually not something they naturally understand. They understand same as or same quantity. I wanted to show you these problems because your children will be coming home with problems written with the question all over the place. The blank can be at the beginning, it can be in the middle, and it can be at the end. And they've got ways of solving them. So 9 plus 7 is the same as what? What else is it the same as? I can't get the answers. It, but it does equal 16. It's also the same as what? 8 plus 8. All of these are great answers. Usually we are probably just looking for the answer 16. I, you know, it depends on the context. Um, but a, a child, if I ask some, a, a child what is eight plus, eight plus six is the same as what, and they came up with one of those other answers, I would be jumping up and down for joy and saying, okay, math's over, you're, you succeeded. We love that flexibility of understanding that numbers, we put them together and we break them apart in order to use them for what we need best. So I'm going to, so I just wanted to show you this. Um, I'll give you the sad statistic. Um, let me think it through. They have given a problem like this in second grade, in fifth grade, in seventh grade, and in tenth grade. By fifth grade, 80% of the kids were getting it wrong because they were so used to that equal sign, meaning, oh, 2 plus 11 is 13. They were not thinking of it as the same as. This is our big Thing that we are trying to teach. They need to think about what's being asked. I would like, if I stick this in, am I going to make this work, Ruben? Yeah. Um, while we get this going, um, there are two games on your table, the yellow and the blue sheet. These are games that will make um, learning the facts to 10 fun. You can play them with your kids. Your kids can play with each other. There are games on the computer that are equally as good. Um, as a mom, I'm just not a huge proponent. If, if I could play with my child, it would be better just because of the time. Um, and I also think the joy that is involved in games and the learning part of it is just such an integral part of family life. But computers are also great. Um, if that's what you've got the time for, um, if they're playing the game on the computer or you know, the iPad, especially if you're in the room and still chatting with them. Um, sit up there. What I do want to share, well, there was your problem, you succeeded. Um, this is kind of a big deal. That we're not giving easy math to your kids anymore. This is, if it's easy, they're not learning anything. They already know it. That's a waste of their time an insult to them. So yes, we are asking them, the kind of the fun word we're using now is to grapple. It means you have to try hard, you have to put in effort, you make mistakes and you learn from them. They are not the end all. Um, flexible with your thinking and you persevere. We're using the word persevere in reading, we're using it in writing, we're using it in math. What does persevere mean? Does it mean when you get stuck you end up in tears? No, it means that we teach you to figure out ways to get around your own problems. If your child gets stuck on homework, please write a note to the parent, to your teacher saying we tried and that's good enough. I would ask you actually to take a deep breath and say, yeah, this is really hard. Shall we try it again? That's what perseverance is about. But take a break. If, if your child, uh, please, 
years old, I don't want to hear this. If they're towards tears, it is. You should have stopped five minutes ago. Math should be fun just like all learning is. As human beings, we are built to enjoy learning. If it's not, you know, I don't mean jump up and down for joy fun, but um, they'll do their best if they're enjoying it. Um, how can you help? Anytime you're in the car, let them count how long that stop spot light is. Um, you can be asking there, you can, if you ask them math facts, they get to ask you math facts. They're going to know whether you're right or not. I mean, so you know, do the, the back and forth. Um, playing the games, puzzles are just a great way of keeping your brain flexible. Uh, your teachers do send home newsletters. We are now sending home strategy letters. They're usually on a colored piece of paper. They would have this sort of stuff on it. We do mean you, for you to keep those and keep it near wherever you do your homework so that you can recognize. Um, owning up to your child that you don't know is just fine. Let's figure it out together. How did you do it in class? Um, <laughs> my, did you take walks with your kid when they were two and why is the sky blue and why is the sidewalk dirty and why, why, why? Well, you get to now ask them, well, why does that work? If they can explain their thinking, they're understanding the math. Remember, Is that one last slide? Uh, enjoy being a positive mathematician and learner of math in front of your child. This is my soapbox, my pet peeve, women. If you dare say I'm not good at math, please don't say that. It's not true. There is nothing in the brain. There are no sides of the brain that make you a good math, a, a bad mathematician or a good mathematician. If you're not very good at math, you didn't have a great teacher, you didn't have the opportunity to learn it, but you can still become good at math. But if we raise another generation of girls saying they're bad at math, and I tell you, it's, this is about girls, that means half our population, we're selling the world short on solving our problems. Our girls need to be good at math. Our boys need to be good at math. Our boys need to be good at reading and writing, which we tend to tell girls they're good at. We've got to get rid of those stereotypes because that's not how the brain works. Any questions? Okay, there will be more of these strategy sessions. They really are to help you understand what your kids are doing in class and so you can chat with them. The last page of your pamphlet um, has a questionnaire about today, about how it went. Um, I borrowed these manipulatives from some teachers and they told me I have to return them in the same manner. Would you put them back together in groups of tens? Um, as best as you can. Uh, I'll save you. You don't have to. <laughs> Those were mine. Yeah, could you fill that out please? That one, we put the box a little longer. Where is, there's three boxes that have to be put 